Check that out. It is conglomeratic as all get out. Get the mojo of the outcrop. Let's get to it. You're looking at it. Climate change is one of a growing list of scientific topics that a whole lot of unscrupulous and scummy politicians and uninformed people have a lot of opinions on, despite knowing almost nothing about. But don't worry, I'm not about to launch into some crazy rant about what is or is not happening in the world's climate today. Instead, I want to look at the early Cretaceous, where the rock record contains evidence that's been interpreted in support of Cretaceous climate change. See, I'm not a climatologist, I'm a geologist. I'm a sedimentary geologist, so my job is to look at the rock record and use that to draw inferences about past climate and other processes. So that is exactly what we're going to do in this incredibly well-exposed outcrop along I-70 in northern Utah. And let me give you a heads up. We're going to be using the tried and true scientific principle of multiple working hypotheses. In other words, we're going to look at all the available data and deduce an interpretation based on what we can or can't see. And if that means we can't discount one or more hypotheses, so be it. We'll have to entertain several of them. Because, you know, you can't always come to a solid conclusion based on the evidence you've been given. And you have to be willing to admit that and accept the results of your inquiry. But first, let's set the context, because without context, you pretty much don't know where you are or what's happening. Hey, welcome back to the Rockorama. I'm Dr. Anton Robleski, and I'm here on the eastern flank of the San Rafael Swell in Utah. And I just passed through a wonderful road cut of early Cretaceous, Cedar Mountain, and Dakota formation. And that's what's in the outcrops behind me. There's a whole lot to say about it. So I thought we could go through, work our way through this outcrop, see what a road cut can tell us about this early Cretaceous succession of environments, and learn something about the fluvial systems and the overbank material that surrounded them on the floodplain. If you're ready for that, let's get to it. The Cedar Mountain Formation is an early Cretaceous unit that's about 130 to 100 million years old. And it's a fluvial deposit, meaning it was deposited by rivers that were flowing from the severe mountains to the west and depositing sediments in the Cretaceous Western Interior Basin. That's similar to what was happening during the late Jurassic when the Morrison Formation was being deposited. A key difference is that the Morrison was accumulating as sea level was falling in the Jurassic Western Interior Basin, whereas the Cedar Mountain was accumulating as sea level started to rise again in the Cretaceous. And as the rise continued, this entire area became flooded by marine deposits, resulting in accumulation of the Dakota or Natarita shallow marine sandstone. The Cedar Mountain has produced a whole lot of dinosaur fossils, mammal fossils, uh, things like the famous Utah Raptor, the giant raptor that was discovered after Jurassic Park came out um, and was named in honor of the state of Utah, is from these deposits. So let's take a walk and check out this underappreciated road cut that for whatever reason, the highway department hasn't felt the need to give any sort of love to, but there are some beautiful exposures in it. And that's what we're gonna go look at right now. The great thing about road cuts is that it's like getting an X-ray into the fresh outcrop face because you don't have any of the problems with weathering, obscuring the rocks like you do on a regular outcrop. So we get a really clear view of the succession of deposits. So if you've watched my videos before, or if you've been on a field trip with me, you know that the first thing I do is tell you, let's not run up to the outcrop. Let's stand back and take a look from afar to get the mojo of it and just kind of see what we see. So starting from the bottom and working our way to the top, like always, first thing we notice is that, hey, look at that. There's some kind of tannish pink to red material that's underlying that big sandstone ledge on the horizon. And then there's a little bit of darker material below it before we get to the sandstone. But look at that off to the right. Above that sandstone, which pinches out, there's some darker gray material and another sandstone. That's pretty informative. Now, I know from looking at this rock before and from reading various papers, that that reddish material that we're looking at right here is a succession of overbank deposits. In other words, that's material that was deposited on a floodplain by a river system every time it jumped its bank. So we have some mud, we have some silt, and we have some sandy layers representing crevasse splays and soils. And we'll talk about soils in a little bit, but that kind of reddish color represents subaerial exposure. In other words, after the river dumps the sediment on the floodplain, it sits out and dries out, and then it starts to basically rust in place. And that's why you get that kind of reddish color in soils. Look at that gray band, and then the sharp, sharp contact with the sandstone, though. That sharp contact is the basal scour of a river channel. And the grayish band is something else. That's a different kind of soil, so we'll have to go take a look at that 
up close and in person. So right in front of us right here, we could see a succession of well-drained, what we would call mature paleosols or mature soils. And you can see that kind of succession of less mature at the base to more mature into the red. Then there's that sort of grayish material, which we'll look at. And finally, the channel sandstone. Here's those same deposits on the other side of the road. And we're getting a good view of the underlying sand and siltstone. Check this out. There's actually a little scour here filled in with sandstones and some mudstones, but it's scouring into an older sand body, which has then got a, it appears to be a scour on the other side. So either we're in like a little abandoned channel fill or maybe a crevasse channel. And those are just little channels that form adjacent to the river channel and they feed crevasse splays. And they're common in these seasonally dry environments. We can get a good look at the base of the channel from here too. Take a look at that. That is some pretty coarse grain stuff. Even from here, you can see the pebbles. It's a conglomeratic channel. It's not just a fine grain sand. That's some pretty heavy duty stuff. So fairly high energy basal part of that fluvial channel, which is exactly what we'd expect in a channel body like this, where it's coarsest grain at the base, finer grain towards the top. So it's following the rules of fluvial channels. Look at the size of some of those clasts. Even from down here, you can see there's some big chunks. That thing's probably about five, six inches long. So however many centimeters, 10, 12 centimeters long. So if you've ever wondered why we call channel sandstone body lensoidal or lenticular, you're looking at it. This is why, here's the edge of that channel. So we're seeing the scour at the base where it incised the floodplain and then the bars and beds filled in the channel body. And then this is a single story channel. In other words, it cut, it filled, and then it evolved somewhere else. It doesn't look like it spent much time stacking one on top of the other or adjacent to itself. It just seems to have just kind of cut, filled, and abandoned. And looky here, looky here, that next channel is actually stratigraphically above our first channel. You can follow the top of that channel body with that line, and then it jumps up before we hit the next channel. So we've got all that floodplain material deposited prior to that channel coming in. Is that a thousand years, 10,000 years, a hundred thousand years, a million years? We don't know without good biostratigraphic data and radiometric data. And that's where those data sets are really useful. And they might exist for here, I'm just not sure of it. Again, turning our attention back to this side of the road, we're getting a good view of the material underneath the channel. And it's silty mudstone, mature red, brick red color stuff. So it's been sitting on the floodplain for a long time. Very, very dark with these little streaks of lighter color material that might be chlorite rich. But this is all typical of very mature floodplain deposits. And here's the edge of that channel. So this channel body, again, lensoidal, pinches out. There we go. It's gone. So we can actually follow that body across the road to right here. That's kind of fun. It's interesting. You can see the change in color of the overbank material. Very red under that first channel but very dark gray, not red, under the second channel. So that's suggesting less mature floodplain material. Suggests that either we had a higher paleo water table or sedimentation rate was higher and the floodplain material didn't have enough time to sit exposed to the air to get rusted. Another possibility is there was a change in climate. We might have seen a drier, more seasonal climate down there and a wetter, less seasonal climate at this time. And in fact, it could have been a combination of all three factors. For example, a cooling of climate and an increase in precipitation would lead to sedimentation rate increase. Likewise, a rise in sea level would have changed paleo water table, which might have accompanied the climate change. So we can't really exclude any or all of these. 
The flip side is that we might not be seeing any changes in any external variables at all, and we might just be seeing a normal lobe switching or retreat of a distributive fluvial system. And I can say that because on a typical distributive fluvial system, the further into the basin you go, the less mature the soils are and the more waterlogged they are because you're meeting a higher water table with lakes and swamps and ponds out on the distal parts of the fan. To figure out which of these scenarios applies to the outcrop we're looking at would require a lot more data from a wider area. But there is an important clue in these rocks and that's in the form of the channel bodies. You see this upper channel body is amalgamated and multi-story which is typically more characteristic of a middle to upper part of a distributive fluvial system and that's at odds with the apparently wetter paleosols, which might be characteristic of a more distal distributive fluvial system. So this suggests that maybe we actually are seeing a change in precipitation and a rise in water table separate from the normal fluvial processes. And that's where the concept of base level comes in. You see, base level is often confused with sea level by a lot of people, but it's actually not that. Instead, it's actually the level at which water and sediment stop eroding and flowing downhill and start filling in a low spot. That low spot can be anything from a prairie pothole to a natural lake or a reservoir that results from construction of a dam. Now, in the Cretaceous Western interior, there's a variety of natural dams in the form of salt walls, salt diapirs, and other tectonic uplifts. So once again, based only on our outcrop observations, we can't really discount any one of our mechanisms for causing this change in soil. It might have been a combination of climate, tectonics, sediment supply, and sea level. And the only sure way to actually test this would be to get some oxygen isotopes out of carbonate nodules in the soils. And that's a topic for a whole other video. I don't want to get into it now. But that's something that a bunch of researchers actually are starting to look into. So we might yet have an answer for this sometime in the future. Interestingly, this channel still has that green layer below it. It's a thicker green layer. But you can see how individual layers of the gray, if you follow them across, get truncated, get cut out by the channel, cutting down into it. And it just keeps going, keeps incising, keeps cutting downward. And in fact, it's got a couple of sand bodies stacked one on top of the other in this channel body. So it's different than that first one. That was a single story. This one's actually multi-story, just meaning there's a couple of channel bodies stacked one on top of the other a view of that floodplain material, that really dark gray with the green, very suggestive of high standing water tables. Not at all like our Paleosol, our dry land sediments below the first channel. Up close and personal with that second channel, you can see where it's really scouring down into the overbank material, but you can also see some large accretion surfaces indicating a bar that's migrating that direction, which is east. And you can see the heterolithics in the bar. You can see there's some mudstones, some sandstones. That's what's giving it that difference in texture. As it's, the sandstone is more resistant. The mudstone, especially the greenish mudstone you can see, uh, is recessive. So there's at least one good bar in the upper part of the channel is probably another bar down here. So there's one bar form. And that one looks, it's again, angled to the east. It looks coarser grained. And I'll show you what it looks like on this side of the road in a second. And then there's a second bar cut into that one. And then over the surface of the entire channel is a scour surface with more bars. And they seem to be coming this way. So that's why we're calling it multi-story is it's a series of bar forms and channel bodies cut one into the, the other, as opposed to just a single one and done channel. These vehicles are really good for scale. Let's take a look at it on this side. So here's the channel body on this side of the road, and you can see that grayish overbank material, kind of grayish red almost, with the green. That's that chlorite rich, uh, immature, reducing mudstone underneath the channel body, probably a function of fluid flow through the channel body, but take a look at that first story in the channel. It is conglomeratic as all get out. Just to give you an idea of the grain size change in this lower part of the channel body, it's very coarse grained, conglomeratic, and then very abruptly goes to a finer sandstone, and then back to conglomeratic, and then back to fine. 
And we've seen this in other Cedar Mountain channel bodies. In fact, I did a video specifically on one of the three-dimensionally exposed channel bodies. If you want to check that out, I'll stick a link in the comments section. So here it is, the Cedar Mountain Formation fluvial system with floodplains and a variety of channel bodies from single story to multi-story and coarse grained to fine grained, nice bar forms. There's a lot going on in this little road cut. And now you know all about it. I hope you enjoyed our little walk through the early Cretaceous succession here in Utah and learned a little something about fluvial systems, climate, tectonics, and all the things that go into creating stratigraphy like we just saw. As always, thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe, and as always, I will see you on the outcrop. Take it easy.